Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am pleased to declare the 2023 commencement for the Quinnipiac University School of Law officially open. Please stand if you are able for the national anthem performed today by Cameron Chaplin, class of 2024. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Yeah. 
You may be seated. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of our platform party. It consists of our speaker, whom you will hear from and meet in a few moments, university administrators, trustees, and alumni board members. It is now my honor to introduce Jennifer Brown, Dean of the School of Law. Good afternoon. So, how about another round of applause for the multi-talented Cameron Chaplin? Woo! Fantastic. It is a joy to gather with you this afternoon to celebrate the friendships, the hard work, and the achievements of our class of 2023. And it is now my honor to present Dr. Judy Olian, president of Quinnipiac University, who will bring you greetings on behalf of the university community. Dr. Olian. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our graduates and their families and friends who are joining us on this really spectacular occasion, spectacular day. Couldn't be nicer. Today is one of the favorite days of my year. Um, it's a day that fills me with utmost pride and joy because we're all here to celebrate you, our amazing Quinnipiac School of Law graduates, your remarkable achievements over the last three years as we mark one of the most momentous and memorable milestones in your lives. Let me welcome first our esteemed guest and speaker, Honorable Victor A. Bolden, U.S. District Judge, District of Connecticut, a visiting lecturer at Yale Law School and soon to be recipient of an honorary degree from Quinnipiac University today. We're honored, Judge Bolden, that you have joined us here today and you will share your wisdom and life's purpose with us and the judge will be more fully introduced in a moment. But please, welcome Judge Bolden. Now I ask our graduates to stand and actually turn to the audience to give thanks to your loved ones, your family and friends, and... And I was going to say, give them an enthusiastic round of applause, but you've already done that. We all recognize spouses, partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, friends, mom and dad, grandparents, siblings, that you all were there for your graduate before every challenge and after every success. So thank you for your role in this special milestone. And while you're standing, let's give a warm round of applause to our wonderful faculty and staff led by our terrific Dean, Dean Jennifer Brown, for the many ways in which they have supported you throughout your journey at QU School of Law by delivering extraordinary learning opportunities and in many cases offering some really good life guidance. You can actually sit down now. Um, I'm quite sure that many of these faculty and staff will remain your friends and mentors for many years to come. It's part of what distinguishes this school of law as a special community that welcomes and supports each other. And now, to our graduates, you made it. You have arrived. This has been a long and winding road. Your parents might remember that phrase. It's from the Beatles. I congratulate you and I thank you for adapting and adjusting so gracefully and generously to the very unusual and likely difficult period of your time in law school, which included, yep, 
a pandemic. You managed to weather that period while supporting each other and also reaching out to others who needed your advocacy. You were an ally to those who needed your help in the community in general and in facing the law. The practice of law, as you know, is rigorous and intellectually demanding. It requires vast knowledge of the legal framework and a capacity to build compelling positions from sometimes untried and unconnected parts of the law. It also requires compassion and humanity, an understanding of how the law impacts the person, the family, the unborn, the future of a corporation, a community, or a government entity. As graduates of the School of Law, I do believe that you're uniquely prepared to serve in this broad and consequential capacity. You have been nurtured to become the whole lawyer, as Dean Brown says. This intentional approach empowers you to bring your personal values and lived experiences to your practice of law, while instilling the knowledge and intellectual dexterity needed to be skilled, impartial, and ethical practitioners of the law. Now, I, I trust your time here these last three years has exposed you to points of view that were unfamiliar, perhaps uncomfortable, even some to which you were absolutely opposed. I hope so, actually. I expect you found ways to discuss these opposing views with your faculty or your peers in a pointed and in a respectful manner. That's exactly what a broad education should be, and that's the foundation of civil society, where there are a plurality of views, a rigorous and thoughtful framework for their debate, and then an orderly structure for resolving and or coexisting with these differences, coexisting. If you've experienced such debate while here at the QU Law School, then we have prepared you well for the important roles in law, and in civic life, you'll assume as lawyers, community leaders, family members, where debate happens, and perhaps even as judges or politicians. Now, today marks the end of one immersive and impressive journey for you and the beginning of another. As skilled and thoughtful lawyers, you may be advocates for those struggling to navigate our complicated healthcare system. Or you might collaborate with social workers and other professionals to help families thrive while overcoming hardship. Or you might help two sides resolve a conflict or reach a settlement through less adversarial methods of dispute resolution. You've also nurtured during your time here concern for broader communities. You've been leaders in critical conversations about the status of human trafficking victims in the legal system. You've prompted provocative conversations, such as the student-driven symposium that explored whether cognitive testing of doctors aged 65 and older was necessary or perhaps discriminatory. You've conducted legal clinics in so many different areas and alongside committed and comprehensive pro bono assistance to our community, you found time to manage a challenging course load and to produce scholarly work. All of your experiences at QU Law have led you to this moment, this springboard into the world of law. As the lawyers of the future, your sacred oath is yours to determine. I expect that you'll frame yours from the foundation of your lived experiences, from growing up in your families, from what you've experienced throughout your schooling, and from your studies here in law school. That's a lot to process and to shape into your own true north, your own personal aspirations, your own values and commitments to the greater good, your intentionality around creating a just and civil society, a goal that appears ever more important in today's more divided and turbulent communities, whether in our country or globally. After three years of law school at Quinnipiac, you've earned more than your JD. You are prepared to do good as the whole lawyers of tomorrow. Now, as I close, 
please remember, this is your home away from home. You are a bobcat for life. That's a long time. Please visit us often and stay connected to the friends, faculty, and staff who have supported you and accompanied you on this journey over the last three years. Today you join a global QU alumni community that's more than 60,000 strong, and I encourage you to take full advantage of that powerful network. All of us at QU will follow your path with great interest. We will unabashedly ride your coattails and boast about your successes, and of course, will beam with pride about the lasting impact you're having in the field of law and in the lives you lead. We wish you the very best. We look forward to seeing you, how you make our world a more equitable and just place for all. Congratulations to the class of 2023. Thank you, President Olian. And thank you for the vision and the resolve and the incredibly hard work that you've poured into this university during your time as our president. Uh, the university and the law school are better because of your leadership. Thank you. You've led us through turbulent and transformative times. So class of 2023, those words, turbulent and transformative, must surely resonate for you as well. As I reflect on this group, I have to say, I, you are an odd bunch. <laughs> okay, I mean, at least the part-time students began law school under normal circumstances, right? They at least had the fall of 2019 to begin their legal education on ground before COVID hit in the winter of 2020. They endured their own tumult and transformation because of that incredible disruption. And I want to say, where are the part-time students? Raise your hands. I I am so grateful to you all for hanging in with us during that year. But you day students, I mean, wow. You ran toward the burning building. You started law school in the fall of 2020 before we had vaccines, while most of our classes were still online, when we all had to wear masks all the time in the building. In, many, in, in, in fact, many of the members of this class spent the entirety of their first year of law school on Zoom, tuning in from far-flung places throughout the United States, maybe abroad at times. It seems a lifetime ago, really. Because in the meantime, we adapted, we acquired new ways to fight COVID, and we returned gradually, and sometimes in a crazy kind of dance that went one step forward and one step back and two steps forward, right? It felt that way at times. But we returned to something that felt like normalcy. So turbulence and transformation might resonate for you, but I'd, I'd like to add three additional words, qualities that I see in abundance in this class, equanimity, enthusiasm, and empathy. I think if I have an overarching quality that I would describe in this class, and it, and it is very difficult to come up with one, it is this word, equanimity. Mental calmness, composure, and evenness of temper, especially in difficult situations. You got through your first year with equanimity. In the fall of 2020 and the spring of 21, while some of the other classes at Quinnipiac were freaking out about various issues, I would ask faculty and staff, yeah, but how are our first years doing? And I would hear, oh, they seem fine. 
They knew what they were getting into, and they're just powering through it. You part-time students, I heard that about you as well. I mean, maybe that comes with the territory of holding down a job or having your families and all the other responsibilities you have in addition to your part-time legal studies. But equanimity, steadiness, it seemed to be the guiding principle for the class of 2023, especially through the craziness of your first year. Then, as we returned in the fall of 21, we kind of gathered you in, right, from all the far-flung places where you had been, and we required you, for the most part, to return to on-ground learning. And some of you hadn't even been to Connecticut before you returned for your second year of law school. Many of you hadn't even set foot in our building. Indeed, we held a special orientation just for the two L's, so some of the people could start to learn the layout of the building and get a bit settled spatially before classes began. But, oh, you know, this is where I saw your second great quality, enthusiasm. Because um, maybe you knew how challenging distance education could be and how isolating Zoom could feel. You threw yourself into community life at Quinnipiac. When we held events or student organizations were looking for participants, the 2L class that fall was there with gusto. And I so appreciate the enthusiasm you brought into the building when you returned, or for many of you, came for the very first time. Because that enthusiasm has carried you and us for these two years that we've had together on ground. And then as you moved into your third year, or fourth year for the part-time students, I saw you embrace the idea that you would be leaders. Whether you were elected to office in SBA, you served on the e-board of a journal, competition team, or affinity bar group, or you simply showed up at Donuts with the Dean with a smile on your face and a little bit of positivity, you were leaders. You got things done, and you rallied your fellow students to work with you. You co-authored mission statements for our DEI committee. You organized symposia and panels. You continued the amazing work of our human trafficking prevention problem project. You raised funds to support fellow students pursuing public interest law projects. And you served our larger community through clinics and externships. And your leadership was born of this third great quality, empathy a fellow feeling for those around you and a sense of your connection to others. You know, nowhere was this more evident to me actually than this spring when one of our second year students was involved in a very serious car accident and members of this class rallied to support her, raising money to help her replace devices that were destroyed in the crash, signing get well cards, buying flowers, and just generally spreading the word among the student body that this had happened and there was a way to be supportive. You were organizing care for a fellow student going through an unthinkably difficult time. Equanimity, enthusiasm, empathy. Hold on to these qualities as you conclude your legal education. At least this part that's been taking place in law school, because I know your legal education will continue and your service to the legal profession will continue. The world and our profession need you. And based on what I've seen these past three or four years, I know you are up to this challenge. So now I invite you to take out the professional oath that is uh, somewhere near your seats. You get an oath, and you get an oath. Yes, you all get an oath. Now, as, as you and many of your family and friends will recall, this is very similar to an oath that you took at the beginning of your legal education. And as you'll see, we've edited it slightly to show that the same or very similar commitments that you made as you came into law school 
will continue to guide and animate your work as lawyers. So I ask you now please to stand if you're able and to raise your right hand and to read with me. I am leaving the academic community of Quinnipiac University School of Law and embarking on a professional career. As a law student and future lawyer, I understand that the study and practice of law carry both privileges and responsibilities. I willingly accept the responsibilities that accompany those privileges and the responsibilities that the faculty, the bench, the bar, and the public entrust to me. I promise to do my utmost to adhere to the ideals of the legal profession and to uphold the highest standards of professional honesty and ethical practice during my career. I will remember that my actions reflect not only on me, but upon Quinnipiac University School of Law, my fellow alumni, and the legal profession. To strengthen the legal community, I will conduct myself with dignity and civility and will treat all of my colleagues with kindness and respect. I will conduct my professional and personal life so as to uphold the values and standards that are expressed in the rules of professional conduct and the traditions of the legal profession. Thank you. You may sit. It is now my honor to invite Judge Victor Bolden, Professor John Thomas, and President Judy Olian forward. The Honorable Victor A. Bolden. As a U.S. District Judge for the District of Connecticut, you represent the clarity, integrity, and purpose required by the judicial branch of our democracy. You are a trusted and respected jurist who has dedicated his entire career to public service, racial justice, and civil rights. After graduating from Harvard Law, you served as a Marvin M. Karpatkin Fellow and later a staff attorney for the ACLU. You have also served as general counsel for NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, a role created by Thurgood Marshall, the nation's first black U.S. Supreme Court justice and held by only a small elite group of lawyers who are among the best civil rights lawyers in the country. As corporate counsel for the city of New Haven, you bore the 24-7 responsibility that comes with serving as the city's chief legal officer, touching every aspect of government at the local level. This path of consequence prepared you well for a distinguished seat on the federal bench after being nominated by President Barack Obama in 2014. Throughout your career, you've been a trailblazer, never shirking in your sense of civic responsibility to lead, teach, and mentor. You have guided teenagers in the law camp, a pipeline program introducing high school students to the legal profession. And you have been a frequent presenter to groups of lawyers, law students, and community members. You've also shown us the way lawyers can balance career with parenting, as you have always prioritized your role as a father. We are honored that your son, Caleb, is joining us this afternoon. Your commitment to your family, your faith, and your community have never wavered, no matter the circumstance. From your legal scholarship to your measured yet compassionate judicial temperament, you have established yourself as a true citizen leader and a friend of the school of law. In appreciation of your relentless pursuit of justice, fairness, and truth, Quinnipiac University is delighted to present to you with this honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters this 12th day of May, 2023. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you, Judge Moulton, the honorary degree of Doctor of Law Honoris Causa with all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations.
graduates, friends, and family, please welcome our keynote speaker, the Honorable Victor A. Bolden. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dean Brown and Dean Thomas, for the very kind words, and President Olian for the honor and the wonderful invitation to address the class of 2023. This class and the students and recent graduates of the law school are fortunate to have someone as wise and as talented as Dean Brown leading it. Today, on your graduation day, class of 23, I want to urge you to be extraordinary. Before discussing what that means, I do want to be clear about what that phrase does not mean, at least to me. I'm not urging you to be extraordinary in the way seemingly most popular today, creating some viral moment on social or other media that is soon forgotten when the next such viral moment comes along. No, today I am urging you to be extraordinary instead by embracing what I consider the true meaning of that term, having an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things. It is these extraordinary things that was born out of an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things which changed the world for the better in a lasting way. The road from Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus education, from state-enforced racial segregation to the point the doctrine of separate but equal had no place in the law, was paved with an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things, showing in excruciating detail the breadth and depth of the vast differences in the educational opportunities afforded to black students in comparison to those afforded to white students. The Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted 381 days and which resulted in a legal ruling clarifying that Brown's unanimous ruling meant that this doctrine of separate but equal had no place in Montgomery, Alabama's municipal bus system, started in part because of Rosa Parks' uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things, a willingness to stand up for her right to sit anywhere on a public bus. That boycott lasted for 381 days because the black residents of Montgomery and their white allies were uncommonly committed to the most ordinary of things. Day after day for more than a year, finding a way other than a municipal bus to get to work, to run errands, or to go anywhere around town. And that uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things, riding a bus and sitting wherever you want on it, inspired a nation to move forward from that city to other cities to end racially segregated public facilities throughout the nation. It provided a platform for then young minister, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to go from Montgomery to Birmingham and from Birmingham to Washington, D.C., to give what many consider to be the greatest speech of the 20th century at the March on Washington, to win a Nobel Peace Prize, and along with countless others, to help pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and then after King's assassination, almost in recognition of his extraordinary life, the passage of the Fair Housing Act of 1968 as well. These extraordinary achievements only happened because people from all races and from many, many places had an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things, public facilities accessible to all, voting booths open to all, and housing opportunities, at least in terms of location, not limited at all. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, if those are examples of people who have been extraordinary, then I cannot measure up. If so, I would urge you to think again. You see, those examples are just that, some examples. There are many, many more. In fact, class of 23, 2023, all of you have someone extraordinary in your life, someone whose somewhat uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things have made it possible for you to be here today. It is that person or persons in your life, likely sitting out in the audience right now or who you wish could be here today who have been with you, if not your whole life, have been there when you needed that person most, who anytime you were sick, nursed you back to health, who anytime you needed something, sacrificed so you can get it, and anytime you needed encouragement, said something to lift your spirits. 
they did and likely would do these things for you again and again for a simple reason, love. But that extraordinary love is manifested in deed and, and felt and hopefully appreciated through an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things involved in caring for and about you. And you too, whether you realize it or not, have shown an uncommon commitment to the most ordinary of things. Each of you have done the most ordinary of things, the reading, the writing, the studying, and more studying necessary to reach this extraordinary moment, graduation from law school. So today, I'm merely urging you to keep being extraordinary and to do so by being uncommonly committed to the, most, to the practice of law. No matter how ordinary you think you are, people are not interested in hiring you to be an ordinary lawyer. They have lawsuits to be brought or defended against. They have contracts to be negotiated and then drafted. They have wills to be drawn. They have been accused of a crime and need someone to defend them, or they have been the victim of a crime and need someone to prosecute it. They have legislation to be drafted, or they have a myriad of other legal problems to be solved. They want to know that you are doing everything you can to help them, that you are listening to them, that you are looking out for them, that you will keep them out of harm's way, and if they are already there, that you will get them out of it. And it is not just some clients who want that, it is all clients who need and deserve that every time. What does that mean? It means not just researching some of the cases most of the time, it means making sure you've drilled down on your legal research all of the time. It means not just being prepared for some or most of your court appearances, it means being prepared for all of your court appearances all of the time. It means not just listening to your client or a prospective client when it is convenient or when you are told what you want to hear, it means listening to your client, a prospective client, and making sure you truly understand the problem all of the time. Several years ago, when I was corporation counsel for the city of New Haven, a woman came to my office seeking help. In fact, she had been coming to City Hall for many years, claiming that she had been wronged. I had met with her before, and I could not figure out what she was talking about, but I arranged for one more meeting with her. Frankly, I did not want to meet with her, at least not then. It was the near the summer, the end of the summer of 2009, and I had a rather eventful first several months of office having to deal with a case in the United States Supreme Court involving the city. I also was close to taking an arguably much needed vacation, yet I met with her and during that meeting, for the first time, I began to understand what she was talking about. I also figured out that I could help her. I decided not to tell her because I wanted to be absolutely certain, but I believed that I could. I left for that vacation and while away, I called into the office to check in and I learned that this woman, who I did not want to see and hoped to avoid before taking a vacation, died shortly after I last met with her. I asked for her funeral information because even though I had not resolved this woman's problem before she died, I could and should at least pay my respects following her death. So I went to the funeral service. There I saw some of the family members reintroduce myself. They greeted me warmly. I, I thought that I had failed this woman when she was alive and surely my appearance would not be welcome. And then during the service, they asked people to say something and I listened as others spoke and then something inside of me said to get up and say something, so I did. I do not remember my exact words. I do remember saying I'd only met her a couple of times but that was enough to know that she was a person of uncommon principle, that she was someone who was dedicated to getting things done. As I left the funeral home, her family thanked me again for being there. I left satisfied about having provided some comfort, but dissatisfied that I had not resolved this woman's problem while she was alive. Not long after that service, I received a letter from that woman's daughter. She said this, I want to thank you so very much for your meeting with her. I don't need to recount the history you're well aware. Thank you for sitting with her. Thank you for listening to her. Thank you for treating her with respect. I was in New Haven the Tuesday she met with you. She was happy that day. She spoke so highly and glowingly of you. She was totally resigned to whatever the eventual outcome because she was confident that someone finally took the time and effort to listen and work on her behalf. Then 
she went on to write this. That day was the last one I saw my mom alive. You see, I thought being extraordinary meant solving her problem. And yes, that would have been extraordinary, resolving a problem that had gone, gone unaddressed. Instead, I learned that the extraordinary existed not just in solving the problem, but also in being willing to listen and see if the problem could be solved, the most ordinary of things. This woman died at peace over at least this issue but that had long plagued her because I took the time, just one more time, to listen to her. And as a result, her daughter, in turn, had peace and gratitude because I did. So if you need one more reason to be extraordinary class of 2023, there it is. What you think may be most ordinary, even inadequate, may be extraordinary to someone else. Class of 2023 on this day, May the 12th of 2023, and from every day of your legal career forward, let it be said not only that you graduated from the Quinnipiac University School of Law, but also that you were uncommonly committed to the most ordinary of things. Class of 2023, go and be extraordinary. Congratulations to you and your families. Thank you again for having me. Have a great day. Thank you so very much, Judge Bolden. Well, I am now pleased to welcome to the podium Mark Schroeder, Associate Dean. Dean Schroeder has done an incredible job in a particularly challenging year, handling both administrative detail and student crises with precision, patience, and kindness. Thank you for your service, Dean Schroeder, and please. I'd like to introduce the Hooding professors, Professor Robert Farrell, Professor Neil Feigenson, and Professor Sheila Hare. <laughs> Marshals, Please direct the candidates for the Juris Doctor degree to the platform. Gabrielle Rae Anastasia. Anastasio. Abigail Samantha Way. Caitlin Burridge. Joshua Amir Bakter. <laughs> Jesse Hyde. Ryan Jamison Roberts. Allison Notewear. Michelle C. Hernandez.
Brian Lamage. Ellie Von Osen. Amy Nikolic. Sophia Orantia McPherson. Ryan McLeod Glushek. <laughs> Natalie Leanne Brown. <laughs> Vincent Joseph DeMeo. Nicholas Giordano. <laughs> Alan Jean Abu Lafia. Thomas Edward Kuhlmeyer. Justin Thomas Court. Andy Staffa. Brittany Alexandra Eckard. Olivia Marie Halley. Alyssa Marie Santos. Sydney Morgan Quint. <laughs> Paige Elizabeth Bonacore. Gabrielle Marie DiGello. Joshua Aaron Zucker. George John Zimmerangus. <laughs> Nathaniel Michael Angelo Scaniff.
Christine Caitlin Taylor. Michelle Pascal. Andrew Mark Keller. Julia McQuaid. Alexa Eden Binkowitz. Brittany Lee Stancavage. <laughs> Rebecca R. Zeuschner. Fernando Daniel Barrigan. <laughs> Sarah Marie Dillahunty. Gabriel Farberov. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Farah Fitz. Mark Aloysius O'Connor. <laughs> William Onyima Okore. Samuel Lieb Andreas Cantos Bleifer. <laughs> Jennifer Lynn Epler. Marina Dawn Siegel. <laughs> Elijah G. McDonald. Amanda Chloe Clay. <laughs> 
Glorialis Latimer. Maria del Carmen Ruiz. <laughs> Paul Matarazzo. Nicholas J. McCreven. McCreven. Gabri Gabrielle Petrie. Ruth Leona N. Clement. <laughs> Hunter M. Rizzuto. Haley Alexandra Vanti. Greta Ungferry. Andrew Nicholas Roden. Anthony J. Martone. Caitlin Mary Stella Dorr. Megan M. Doyle. Marshall Merwine Hanyon. Asher B. Seisler Fletcher. <laughs> Nicholas Lee Scarlett. Jordan Anthony Vizzano will be, will be hooded by his mother, Kelly Vizzano, class of 1991. Uh. 
Robert J. Silver. Alana Marie Ferrigno. Catherine Victoria Ingersoll. <laughs> Jack Fenton Clark. Nikki Abbasud. <laughs> Alessandra Marie Santa Cruz will be hooded by her father, Tony Santa Cruz, class of 1986. Griffin M. Kutzner. Ian Leon. Grace Alby Braun Fails. Marissa Rose Infante. <laughs> Nina Catanzaro. Ashley Netta Corasani. Magdalena Green Morales. Laura Lucille Batty. Jacqueline Cuculino. Jamie Ann Kelly. <laughs> Sandy Rose Samron.
Oliver Morris. Zachary Sousa. Marcello Anthony Catapano. Rafael Anthony Martinez. Jack Levinson. Kyle A. Canone. <laughs> Mrs. Caroline A. Rainus, hooded by Charles C. Deer Dearborn, class of 85, and Marine, Marine P. Hill. Sayus Hill, Hillo, also class of 85. Did I butcher that? Carolyn Ashley Consiglio. Ariana Olson. Shelby M. Ross. Hugh T. Sokolsky, Jr. <laughs> Kendall Elizabeth Vogt. James D. Meade, Jr. Cassandra Elizabeth Pomerico will be hooded by her uncle, an adjunct professor, class of 1990, Thomas Esposito. Jake G. Kina. (laughs) 
Julia E. Lambert. Nora Galbraith McNeil. Aaliyah Zane Dye. Jordan Clark Levin. Paula Yasmin Gutierrez. Kimberly M. Bird, Carolina. Crystal Tuttle Goodson. Karina Arredondo. Scarlett Laura Alcantara. Kimberly Smith Katala. Cassidy Martin. Jacqueline Levake. I remember from the hockey. Stephen Vincent Cangiolosi. Nicholas Bader. Sean Michael Trueheart. Randy Ashley Roberts. Jess Osme Jacques. Rachel Morgan Engelman. Elise Renee Rosen.
Emily V. Carase. Carase. Caitlin E. Murphy. <laughs> Julia H. Jedrakowski. Lucas Raymond Sunwall. And now I ask the candidates to rise as they are able. Madam President, I have the honor to present from the School of Law candidates for the degree Juris Doctor. Thank you, Dean Brown. By the power vested in me, by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor with all of the rights and privilege pertaining thereto. Now I'll ask everyone uh, to be seated. And I am very pleased to call to the podium our student speaker, Hugh C. Tuk Sikulski, Jr., Class of 2023. Wow. Quinnipiac Law family, it is a tremendous honor to stand before you today as we celebrate our graduation. This is a momentous occasion and represents the culmination of years of hard work, dedication, and preservation. I want to begin by expressing our, my deepest gratitude to our professors, mentors, and loved ones who have supported us every step of the way to arrive here. To my fellow graduates, as we reflect upon our law school journey, I would like to share a personal story. During our second year of law school, we were fortunate enough to make it over the hurdle that was COVID-19 and celebrate with our first Barrister's Ball. I remember walking into a cramped elevator to go downstairs and celebrate with my best friends, the people in this room. In the elevator, I met a young man. He, like many of the people in this room, was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life. He asked me why I was all dressed up and where I was headed, and I explained what Barrister's Ball was. This young man then asked if I liked law school and if I would recommend it as a career. I was stumped. 
In the elegant brochure for law school, you are promised the lavish office and a lifelong love of your career. The brochure does not advertise to the young man in the elevator about committing to the long nights of studying while your family spends time together or your friends go out to dinner without you. The brochure does not explain the importance of self-growth and the, how much it is required to adapt to multitasking, focusing, developing into the graduate who sits here today. And they especially do not tell you about Professor Neil Feigenson and the comments he leaves on the right-hand side of your writing assignments. This is what I wanted to tell the young man in the elevator. But then I thought, if I was in charge of the brochure for law school, I would advertise with three simple words, which I hope guide you through your careers in what I told the young man in the elevator. If you forget these three words, just remember CIA, like a super spy. Courage. In the brochure for law school, I would advertise how law school ingrains courage in yourself. The cold call in front of your 50 peers is courage. Learning how to answer a final exam question that is equally as long as war and peace is courage. <laughs> Committing to three years away from your loved ones is courage. And most of all, it takes courage to accept a mistake and learn from it. So having used this courage to arrive in your seat today, I implore you all to be courageous enough to step outside your comfort zone, apply for a new job, learn a new specialty, and never give up. Above all, be courageous enough to take on a client who has never experienced a compassionate lawyer. Now is when we become the whole lawyer Dean Brown has encouraged us all to be. Think about the courage we had when we were once the young man in the elevator and the courage it took to say yes to our law school acceptance. Improvement. We have all improved throughout our law school journey and now we must continue to improve. I think we can all learn from Master Yoda when he said, the greatest teacher failure is. Failure is a stepping stone to our success and not something to fear or to avoid. Law is not immune from mistakes. One tiny mistake will serve us for years and years to come. It is how you better an argument, better your home, your car, and learn how to be a better family, family member or a better friend. Improvement means not telling the man in the elevator do not follow your dream. Attitude, the final word on the brochure. When I say attitude, I'm saying make a positive impact on others. Be happy with what you do. Be kind to others and keep a positive outlook on the world. Everyone in this room wearing a cap and gown has had a positive impact on my life. So do not stop there. We have been privileged enough to live in the United States privileged enough to receive an education and privileged enough to now enter the legal profession. But with great power comes great responsibility. We have the responsibility to be a difference in our clients' lives, our communities, and beyond. Be agents of change, advocates for justice, and champions for inclusivity. Be positive so when the young man in the elevator asks if he should go to law school and the elevator door dings, he steps off excited for the next steps in his career. In conclusion, I want to congratulate each and every one of you on this incredible achievement. And while everyone has had an opinion on the purpose of the day, it above all stands for reflection. So while you sit here, look back on what we have accomplished and what we have learned and turn forward toward the bar, new jobs, and whatever adventures lie next. Let's celebrate this in the future to come. After all, I think we can finally answer the man in the elevator with a resounding yes, go to law school. Thank you and congratulations to the Quinnipiac University School of Law, class of 2023. We will be recruiting Hugh for our admissions staff. Very well, this year marks our next speaker's final year as a full-time professor, as he will be retiring this summer. And I am so grateful that he'll continue to teach contracts and we'll still get to see him regularly. Uh, but you will miss the committee work and the faculty meetings and all of that. No? No? You want? Mm -hmm. Okay. Graduates, friends, and family, our Professor of the Year, Robert Farrell.
Good afternoon to all and my enthusiastic congratulations to the law school class of 2023, a group of very special people. And thank you for selecting me as professor of the year and asking me to speak at your graduation today. It's a great honor and I'm deeply grateful. You may be surprised to hear, however, not all my faculty colleagues were happy about your selection. <laughs> Professor Cooper has been saying to anyone who will listen, you know, students didn't select Professor Farrell because they actually think he's a good teacher. They picked him because he's old, he's retiring, it was entirely a sympathy vote. <laughs> Professor Cooper, I'm not happy to hear you talk that way about me. <laughs> but I have to say, it's actually true. I was selected because I'm retiring. Okay. But I have one thing more to say. In years to come, Professor Cooper, when you retire, even with the sympathy vote, you'll never be Professor of the Year. <laughs> and of course, I'm not the only one retiring this year. Linda Meyer, after many years, is moving on, and students are understandably heartbroken about this. I had a conversation with a couple of students when they heard about her retirement. And the first said, I can't believe Professor Meyer is retiring. She's irreplaceable. She knows everything about constitutional law. She's the best teacher. And she was a Supreme Court clerk. I just love her. And the second one said, and she does so much more outside the classroom. She's a great scholar. She writes about mercy and theories of punishment, works so hard to help women in prison. The school will never be the same without her. And I said, yeah, I agree with everything you just said. Linda Meyer is wonderful. But did you hear? I'm retiring too. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, but didn't you get the memo from Dean Brown? We've already hired a fantastic contract teacher who's coming in to take over your classes without skipping a beat, and students won't even realize you're gone. So I did learn something from that conversation. I'm passing it on to today's graduates as career advice, and keep this as mine when you go forward your own careers. Here's the advice. Don't ever retire the same year Linda Meyer retires. <laughs> How about my good friend Kevin Barry? I remember when Kevin came in, I'd already been teaching here for more than 20 years, and people said, he's kind of a junior version of Bob Farrell. He's Irish, he knows the Irish songs, he's a good teacher. And people initially thought of Kevin as my protege. And at that time, they said, wouldn't it be great if someday Kevin could be as good a teacher as Bob Farrell? And then a few years went on, and students got a different perception. And then I heard during the advising session, students were saying, well, you know, Kevin Barry, he's really just as good a teacher as Bob Farrell. So I was happy for Kevin. And then a few more years happened, and then I found the advice people were given Kevin Barry is a better scholar and teacher than Bob Farrell. You should take his administrative law class. Well, I was deflated by that, but I could, I could live with it. But then last fall, I heard a conversation, and it was this conversation that sent me directly to Dean Brown's office with my retirement papers. The first student said, I think Kevin Barry is a much better teacher than Bob Farrell. The second student said, who's Bob Farrell? All right, Kevin, I'm retiring, leaving the field to you. All right, let's move on. Dean Kuhar, who loves to give unsolicited advice, which I usually resent, but she gave me some today, which was right on the money. She said, please don't spend your time talking about yourself and your relationship with the colleagues. Graduation should be about the students. It's their day, their accomplishments, their triumphs. All right, so Dean Kuhar, I'll, I'll follow your advice. And what a law school career it was for this year's graduates. For the day students, your entire year was almost entirely taught on Zoom, and for the evening students, your second year. I taught every contracts class to both sections from August to May from my sunroom on Zoom. Now, Zoom had its upsides and downsides as well. On the positive side, Ruth Leona Clement without ever leaving her kitchen in New Jersey, was the star of the contracts class and did, made the most contributions. <laughs> Aaliyah Dye, while ever leaving West Virginia, was able to participate fully in contracts, along with her cat, who, who made regular appearances on the computer screen. 
Ms. Dye told me at the end of the first semester, her cat had almost mastered the bargain theory of consideration. <laughs> now there was, of course, a downside. How many remember that unfortunate incident where I insulted Carmen Ruiz's mother? I called on Ms. Ruiz in class to discuss the case, and while she was speaking, there was some background noise. I said to her, I think you need to adjust your computer settings. There's some background noise, and I'm having a hard time hearing you. And Ms. Ruiz says, those are not computer settings. That's my mother working in the kitchen, and she doesn't appreciate your thinking you can tell her what to do in her own home. <laughs> and I hear your mother's here today. Please introduce us after, and I'll, introduce, I'll apologize personally to your mother. Thank you. And students also couldn't help focusing on Megan Doyle's computer screen, where there was always behind her a sign that said, gather. And we couldn't decide whether it was menacing or welcoming. <laughs> um, but maybe you'll let us know after today's graduation. Now, Amanda Clay took great joy in trying to select the winner of the worst villain in the contracts casebook. There were so many possibilities. Was it, and I tread on some tenuous ground here, was it the New England Patriots who took horrible advantage of their season ticker holder by enforcing um, a liquidated damages clause? Was it the Walker Thomas Furniture Store who used cross collateral clauses and pro rata repayment terms so the customers were always at their mercy? Or was it the evil Garland Coal Company who took advantage of the poor little PV houses by not restoring their family farm after strip mining it. And Ms. Clay, I think I'll agree with you on balance. I'll pick the evil Garland Coal Company. And then there was Justin Court, who from the moment of his birth was destined for success in law school and greatness in the practice of law. We all look forward to the day in the future when the judicial bailiff announces all rise as Judge Court enters the court. <laughs> Andrew Keller left behind a career treating cardiac patients for a career studying physician defendants. Should the doctor in Hawkins versus McGee, who promised his patient a perfect hand, should he have to pay the patient the expectation measure of damage when their performance fell short? Well, what do you think, Dr. Keller? Couldn't it at least been limited to reliance damages? Now, in the fall of your first year, when COVID was still prevalent, Natalie Brown was one of the few students who joined me and Dean Carr, Dean Kuhar, on an outside walk around the campus. Not a virtual walk, an actual walk. And then she went on from there to win a host of awards and prizes and be a true leader in her, in her class. <laughs> Oliver Morris, he was already a classical scholar before we came to law school, and he used his knowledge of Latin and Greek grammar to win writing awards here and there and everywhere. And he was the only one in first year contracts who understood the literal meaning of the phrase consensus ad idem in the famous case about the two ships peerless. And Caitlin Dorr, who arrived at the law school with the same name as Red Sox Hall of Fame second baseman Bobby Dorr, and over three years made herself into a Hall of Fame Editor-in-Chief of the Quinnipiac Law Review. She's going to get her own plaque in Cooperstown. And I, I look carefully at, at the sea of graduates today, I ask myself, who has the best haircut? It's clearly Jordan Levin, who, like me, gets his hair cut by Bernard Pellegrino at Y Haircutting in New Haven. I think we were both there this week to get a touch up, Jordan. Now I have to say, Jordan, I'm sure you are indebted to your family, your friends, to your fiance for all they have contributed to your accomplishments, but given how important making an impression is, you're also indebted to Bernard Pellegrino. Please give him a call. All right, how about the evening students? A very important part of the law school community. Now I did not have the good fortune of teaching any of you during this 
four-year period. But I want to say over 39 years, I taught evening students many, many semesters. And I have never stopped marveling at what evening students accomplish. Many of them have full-time jobs. Many have substantial family responsibilities. And yet they take the same classes, are held to the same standards, and prepare for the same bar. And over the years, some of our very strongest students have been evening students. Although I did not teach you, I did come to know some of the evening students through my work on the awards committee. So Mark O'Connor is graduating. He's from New Haven's Westville O'Connors. That's my own neighborhood. He worked full time as a Madison police officer while completing all the requirements of his degree. And William O'Corey, after leaving his native Nigeria to come to America to further his education, he arrived here at Quinnipiac Law School and received the honor of being hit the very best student in his constitutional law class. And Kimberly Carolina, to whom I was introduced before she started law school by our mutual friend Jack Polishin. Now Jack was a legendary teacher at Hill House High School in New Haven. He's sadly no longer with us today, but I want to say, Kimberly, if Jack were here, he'd be so proud of your accomplishments and he would look forward to all you're going to do going forward. And I would like to speak about every graduate, but I, I cannot do that, but I want to say every one of our graduates has made a unique contribution to the law school and I am sure will make a unique contribution to the practice of law going forward. So after 39 years, what do I think of my time at Quinnipiac Law School? Well, my first thought is, well, where did the time go? I still remember my first day teaching my first class, Remedies at 9 a.m. in Bridgeport, and there's been a lot of water under the bridge since then. One of the great miracles of teaching for 39 years at a university setting is that while on the one hand, each year, I get older, slower, this isn't pleasant, heavier, my hair gets grayer and then whiter, but on the other hand, every year, the students miraculously are the same age. They arrive every fall enthusiastic, energetic, focused, curious, and willing to participate actively in class discussions. Students are the lifeblood of this institution. And they make sure it remains a lively, vibrant place, a place I have loved to arrive at each morning for 39 years. Now, 39 years means you can see general, generational change happening before your eyes. So I have taught a mother contracts and then later her daughter. That's Sandy Lax and Leslie Lax. I've taught two father-son pairs, Frank Aiello and Brett Aiello, and then later Carl Sokolda Sr., Carl Sokolda Jr. This year I taught Michaela Karen in contracts. I also taught her father, Michael Karen, and Caroline Reynas, who's graduating today. I taught her mother, Maureen Hilla. All right, I don't expect to be impressed by that. I'm sure hundreds of professors have taught parent-child pairs. All right, how about this? I taught James Abbott in contracts this year, and he told me that I taught his grandmother. <laughs> Rita von Item, class of 88. Wow. And when I told, Mr. Abbott told his grandmother that he had me for contracts, she said to him, perhaps predictably, how old is he? <laughs> so let me just say a few things. I love Quinnipiac, which has been the defining institution of my adult life. I bleed Quinnipiac blue and gold. I celebrate with Boomer the Bobcat. I love Quinnipiac law students who have been such a, an important part of my life for all these years. I work with the best faculty colleagues. We have wonderful administrators and staff. And I thank the housekeeping staff and the public safety officers for the important jobs they do every day. And as I look back, perhaps getting a little nostalgic, I can't help but think of my four immigrant grandparents from Ireland who arrived in America with very little. If they only could see me today, they would marvel. How did this grandson of ours end up going to Harvard and then having such a fabulous and fulfilling career 
at Quinnipiac University School of Law. How indeed. Now, it's traditional for graduation speakers to give some advice. I'm probably not that good, but I do have a very short bit of advice from the heart. Be kind, be empathetic. If you do this, those who interact with you will be much better off in, in a strange kind of alchemy of reciprocity. You'll be better off too, so keep that in mind. All right, winding down. There are some special people here today I'd like to call attention to. My wife and lifetime partner, partner Mary Jean. My three daughters, Aileen, Maureen, and Deirdre. Two of my three sons-in-law, J.W. and Craig. And finally, and most wondrously, my grandchildren are here. Grandchildren, please stand up. Peter, Garrett, Quinn, Dylan. Charlotte, Fiona, Teddy. Okay, well, for the honor, thankfully, I'm almost done. I'm going to end with a song. And graduates, I need your help. It's got verses and a refrain. I need you to sing the refrain. So please help me out here. One minute. You, you, law school was an awesome place, so everybody said. The lawyers and the judges thought it grand, so everyone was glad when they heard the people say that its students are the finest in the land. Oh, here we go. And there were mooters, QUers, and even law reviewers. Some love tax, law, health, or family. There were those who did the clinics and externship prolific, and at QU Law, they all earned their degree. First year contract students learned the law. It's all made up of threes. The bargain theory was their favorite part. But once they learned reliance and past benefit conferred, their professor knew they're off to a good start. Here we go. And there were mooters, QUers, and even law reviewers. Some love tax, law, health, or family. There were those who did the clinics and externships prolific, and at QU Law, they all earned their degree. <clears throat> Core electives filled up second year. Jeff Cooper was required, <laughs> but wills and trusts were not their cup of tea. But he'd have done a better job if he only understood the rule against perpetuity. And there were mooters, QUers, and even law reviewers. Some loved tax, law, health, or family. There were those who did the clinics and externships prolific. And at QU, all, they all earned their degree. Third year's experiential as they learned to practice law. The clinics and the externships were great. Dean Cass was lost in conferences, in person or on Zoom, but their skills make them the finest in the state. And there were mooters, QUers, and even law reviewers. Some love tax, law, health, or family. There were those who did the clinics and externships prolific, and at QU Law, they all earned their degree. Last verse. 
And now we're graduating, and we must leave this place. But its spirit inside us will never lack. And as we practice law in time, our work will always show that we are grads of Quinnipiac. And there were mooters, QUers, and even law reviewers. Some love tax, law, health, our family. And there were those who did the clinics and externships prolific. And at QU all, they all earned their degree. Thank you very much. <laughs> And now we know why Professor Farrell's Irish sing-along has always been one of the most popular items at the Public Interest Law Project auction. Yes. Okay, we're almost there, but we have one important thing for our graduates to do, because it is my pleasure to introduce Regina Thornton, who will welcome our graduates into the community of alumni. Attorney Thornton is a double bobcat having received her MBA in 1988 and her JD in 2000. Also, while a student at the law school, she served as a research fellow for the Center on Dispute Resolution. And I just got to tell you guys, I would go around to conferences, and her research was something I was very happy to take credit for. So a great student and a devoted alumna, thank you for joining us today, Attorney Thornton. Good afternoon. It is my um, pleasure, privilege, and honor to be here on such a beautiful day, to stand before you as a member of the class of 2000 and a member of the Law Alumni Association. Before addressing the graduates, however, I'd like to recognize the Quinnipiac alumni who are joining us in the audience today who, as family members of the class of 2023. So if you are a QU alumnus, please stand or raise your hand to be recognized. I see some. Thank you. Thank you. Now I ask the graduates to please rise as able. And I'm going to invite you to do what I'm doing here. We're going to take our tassels and we're going to move them from the right side to the left side of our cap. This simple act signifies your transition from student to alumnus and the continuation of your unique, meaningful, and lifelong relationship with Quinnipiac University. I'm especially pleased to welcome you all as fellow alumni, and I wish you the best as you begin your legal careers. You are a Bobcat for life. Congratulations. Be seated. Thank you. Now, as we conclude today's ceremony, um, only the platform party will recess out of the arena. So our new graduates are able to meet up with your families and guests within the arena. You're invited to uh, a, a, a reception that will be taking place at, right after this up at the Rocky Top Student Center. And anyone who needs assistance with getting to the Student Center, please exit the arena and, and go out to the shuttle golf cart waiting area to the left, I think, as you go out the door. On behalf of President Olian, the faculty and staff of Quinnipiac University School of Law, I again offer congratulations to the class of 2023. Please stand for the recessional. Bye. 
Thank you.